Hey everybody, it's Lon Seibin and it's time for your weekly wrap up. Autumn is here. I've got my sweater on and it's getting cold outside, but that will not stop the show. And I want to begin first, as we always do, by thanking our newest Patreon supporters. We have Kalyan Kumar, who's a new Gold Level supporter. Thank you very much, Kalyan, for your contribution. Carl Davis, Duncan Cunningham. We also have a few more this week. Richard Schnatterly, Martin Paoloni, Matthias, I'm going to mess this one up, Nicholas Jason uh, Kajagard, I hope I got your name right there, and Matt Jeske, who gave via the tip jar. I want to thank everyone who contributed to the channel this week, as well as all of you who have been continually contributing over the years here, and for everyone who watches the channel also, because all of those things equal channel growth, and I am very grateful for everything that you've done for me, because we are now over 150,000 subscribers. I also want to thank our sponsor this week, which is once again the great website AFTVnews.com. And my friend Elias Saba runs that site, and he covers everything and anything about the Amazon ecosystem. And there is quite a bit to cover because there are a bunch of new Amazon hardware devices, some of which we'll be getting into the channel here. And I do suggest heading over to Elias' site because he dives deep into all of them. And I think you will find a lot of cool new ways to use your Amazon hardware. He's also the author behind one of the top-selling free apps on the Amazon App Store called Downloader, and that allows you to sideload Android apps onto your Amazon Fire devices. A great app, really well put together, and uh, definitely worth checking out. And now there's a version for Android TV as well. Please join me in thanking Elias for his contribution to the channel. So this week on the Extras channel, I unboxed two computers and a doorknob attachment, as well as doing a follow-up video on the Acer Swift 1 that I uploaded on the main channel this week. I also went out to New York City on Thursday for a, a little mini trade show that they do out there once a quarter from a company called Pepcom, and they had uh, 70 different consumer electronics companies in one room. So I spent about three hours with my buddy Antonio. We went and met all these different companies, and I posted up some videos and some of the things that I thought you all might find of interest. And you can check all of that out, uh, link down below in the master playlist. I will be uh, talking a little bit more about the things that I look for at those shows a little later during during the Q&A segment. But I did want to do a follow-up, though, on some questions that people had about my trip to New York City, specifically the equipment that I chose to use. And more than a few folks suggested that I use a clip-on mic at these kinds of events, and I would love to be able to do that. But unfortunately, these rooms are so noisy that most lavalier mics, even those with a cardioid head on the top, really do not do very well in environments where there's just a lot of background noise from people talking and everything else that was going on in that room. So I've been uh, very pleased with my Sennheiser AVX mic that I used here. Uh, in full disclosure, I got one of these kits through the Amazon Vine program, but I liked it so much I bought a second one for uh, doing field production. I'm probably going to get another uh, stick mic in the near future. These things are great because they're wireless, and this is a little uh, receiver that I use with it. It plugs right directly into my camera. I just turn them on, they pair up, and they handle all of the frequency changes automatically depending on uh, interference in the room. I'll put a link down below to uh, the review I did of this system. So yeah, it would be great to be able to have my hands free, but unfortunately it's just not going to work from a technical standpoint given uh, the noise in the room. Now I think what I might do in the future is uh, maybe do a little more B-roll so I can demonstrate something for you without having to take a pause and put the mic aside or maybe talk into it like this while I'm trying to do something with some of the equipment I'm handling. What happens is we get to these events, you have about three hours to get through the entire room, and there was so much stuff there, I didn't want to miss anything. So we were kind of going uh, like a steamroller through there, trying to get as much footage as we could uh, before we had to move on to the next thing. So this would be an area where as I grow and I can get another camera person with me, I can have them trail behind collecting B-roll that we could use to more efficiently put these things together. But these are really good networking opportunities for me, and I really like to just bring along uh, you all with me and show you some of the things that caught my eye while I was there. And uh, this stick mic really uh, makes it worthwhile because I did have a nice comment from somebody who said, wow, the audio on this was much better than I usually see at some of these shows. And that's because I do carry the stick mic and uh, try to talk pretty close into the microphone. One of the challenges though with this mic is that if I don't have it in the exact same spot every time, uh, the levels will be wildly different when I bring it into my editing software. So I really have to keep in mind to keep that mic at the same spot. I did a lot of audio adjustments on that video to at least keep it somewhat consistent so it didn't get too low or too loud uh, as I was moving throughout that room. But uh, I do appreciate everyone's advice on that. I'm going to experiment though. I did just buy a, a new uh, cardioid microphone 
looking for uh, my clip-on system here that might do better. So maybe when I go out to CES next, I'll do a couple of test shots with that and see if I can get by with just that microphone. But I think we're going to have to be sticking to this thing uh, for the foreseeable future. And I also wanted to do a follow-up on the August Smart Lock Pro because one of the things that I complained about in that review was that it wasn't pushing out notifications very readily and it looked like you might have to actually pay for a subscription fee uh, to get notifications delivered to your smartphone every time somebody locked or unlocked your door. And I felt like that was not really such a great thing on a $229 product to begin with. But a few people wrote in who own one of these things who also own an Apple TV. And in case you're not familiar with how Apple's HomeKit works, uh, the Apple TV works like a home hub as well. And if your Apple TV is in Bluetooth range of your lock, uh, the Apple TV will uh, handle all of the transactions going back and forth to that device and send you immediate notifications. So if you are using an Apple TV in your home, uh, you might get better luck with your notifications than I was getting with mine. So uh, just a little add on to that review. So now it's time for a couple of things that are on my mind. And this is week number 30 of me doing this as a full-time occupation. And it is also the third or fourth week now that I've had an employee here uh, to help me out with things going on in the channel. And that has probably been the best thing I've done in 30 weeks here was bring on uh, our new person here. Corey's been great. Uh, he's picking up the ropes very, very quickly. In fact, he's turned out to be an excellent video editor. He edited most of what you saw over the last week too. So he's really proving himself to be a multifaceted and multifunctional individual, which has been uh, awesome for getting things through here on the workflow. And I'm hoping to be able to pump out more content. And as I mentioned, I wanted to have a good uh, queue of videos that are ready to go at any given moment. And I think we're getting to that point very shortly. I got a couple of sponsorships that we're working on and a few things on the business development side that have taken me away from shooting, but I've been able to keep up the pace of posting like I'd like it to because uh, he's here to help get things set up and everything else. It's really amazing when you look at carving 20 hours that I would have spent on other things now, being able to delegate that to him, uh, which frees me up to uh, get my shooting done and then do things to help grow the business. Another great thing has happened here, which is the purchase of this device. I reviewed this a couple of weeks ago, or maybe two weeks ago now, I can't even remember. Uh, this is the New Tech Connect Spark. And what this device does is it allows me to extend my cameras anywhere I have a network connection. And as you can see from the antenna, antennas on it, it works over Wi-Fi too. So when we did that August door lock, for example, I had this thing set up on the other side of the room where the lock was. I was able to point the camera at that, integrate it right into my workflow in real time, just like any other camera would uh, into my TriCaster, and it just works. It's been amazing. So I might start doing some more green screen stuff because my green screen is located on the other side of the room over there. I never used it all that much because I have to haul my entire equipment rack over there. Uh, now I can just plug this in with a camera and do some green screen stuff. So I, what I might do next week or the week after uh, is maybe do the wrap up on one of my virtual set pieces that I have uh, inside of my TriCaster. It might be kind of fun to shake things up a little bit and put me in a different environment. So stay on the lookout. I might be uh, doing that in the near future. So now it's time for a few things in the news that caught my eye this week. The first was an article I saw in PC Gamer about the Atari box that I mentioned a few weeks ago. And my hope for this was that it would be a cool, inexpensive, retro throwback console that might be able to play some new stuff, but I would play mostly the old stuff, and that does not look like the strategy here that Atari is employing. It's going to be going for a uh, AMD custom processor, as you can see here, with Radeon graphics. I would guess this is going to put it in the class of maybe the Xbox One, the original one, or the PlayStation 4 when those two consoles both first came out. Those do have uh, similar custom AMD processors, but the price on this one is coming in at close to $300, if not more. And the worst part is they're crowdfunding it through Indiegogo. So again, you, the customers, will be sharing the risk with the Atari brand on this thing. I don't get what their strategy is here. We'll have to see what their software plan is. Maybe if they put Steam on it or something, it might be of, of more value because there would be a built-in base of uh, software. But then again, you could probably build or even buy your own little cheap AMD powered PC and get the same experience. So I'm not sure where they're going with this thing. And the Indiegogo thing was a big turnoff for me. So I will keep an eye on this, but uh, don't expect me to contribute to its uh, Indiegogo unless there's something really good about it. But I don't think we're going to see that. Now, this next story really concerned me because it is something that is a growing trend on the internet, which are companies abusing the DMCA to go after people they don't necessarily like. And in this case, the developer of the Persona 5 game called Atlas 
uh, decided to issue a DMCA takedown request against the RPCS3 emulator, uh, namely their Patreon page where they raise funds for their project. And uh, what the RPCS3 emulator allows people to do is play PlayStation 3 games on a computer. And one of the games that the emulator people put as compatible on the Patreon page was Persona 5 that Atlas publishes. And they did not like the fact that this game ran on their emulator. So rather than uh, go to the Patreon and say, hey, take down any reference to uh, Persona 5 or any screenshots they may have posted, which I think they would be within their rights to do, they decided to try to get the entire project removed from Patreon. And they were pretty much unapologetic about this because they uh, believe that the best way to play their game is on the PlayStation and accuse everyone of playing the game on the emulator as being essentially stealing it or getting it for free. And uh, this is an unfortunate development because Atlas doesn't own any IP of the hardware uh, that runs the PlayStation. And if this emulator was in fact violating anyone's IP, it would likely be that of Sony who hasn't gone after them yet. Uh, you would imagine they probably would at this point. Uh, thankfully, Patreon uh, stood up for the project and uh, took down the references to the Persona 5 game, but is not taking down the project page as a whole. But I don't think we've heard the end of this story just yet. Now, one thing that's new in the emulation world is the fact that many popular emulators now, especially for some of these complex consoles like the Wii U or the PlayStation 3 in this case, do all have Patreon pages. And some of them are making a good amount of money uh, having these Patreon pages set up and offering, uh, in many cases, exclusive beta access to patrons to get uh, the early uh, versions of these emulators before their mainline versions are released to the public. And this is a new development we're seeing now in the emulation world, where a lot of these uh, very complex emulation projects, like things that run the Wii U or the PlayStation 3 in this case, are setting up these pages, bringing in a good amount of money per month to support the development costs, and then offering people who are paying early access to the betas of software that eventually gets released to the world for free. And the real difference here is that in the past, uh, emulators were always free, even for the betas. But now that these groups are starting to make a little bit of money, I wonder if this might attract the attention of Sony, for example. I think back to probably the late 90s or so, maybe the early 2000s, when the Dreamcast was the big deal. Uh, there was an emulator on the Dreamcast as well as on the PC called Bleem. And what that allowed you to do was run PlayStation 1 games, which was still a, a very viable console at the time, uh, on your Dreamcast as well as on your PC. And Bleem was a commercially available piece of software probably legal, but what Sony did is they took them to court and just beat them down so much they couldn't afford to stay in business anymore. And I wonder if that might be uh, the track we might see Sony and perhaps other hardware manufacturers like Nintendo go in uh, if they decide that these, uh, these groups are making too much money trying to uh, replicate their original hardware. So even though the software might be legal, it may not be enough to protect them from the legal onslaught that uh, might await them if one of these companies decides to exert themselves. And this is an example, perhaps an early example of a software developer doing that, but I hope uh, Sony doesn't decide to do the same thing because they may have a better leg to stand on uh, given, again, these groups are raising a good amount of money via Patreon. Love to hear what you think down below in the comments. And now it's time for some Q&A from you, the viewers. And our first question comes in from TW116, who's wondering if I've ever covered Sling TV and Hulu TV and a few of the other uh, TV options are, that are out there for getting cable channels over the internet. They're getting more and more popular because people are able to cut their cable cord, get a decent broadband connection, and then bring in their cable as a streaming service, which is great if you want that. But I am finding that most of these services are not any better than the cable packages we're trying to get rid of. And I'm gonna show you a few examples of what I am talking about. Now, Sling TV was the first one out of the gate with this stuff. They call themselves the quote unquote a la carte cable provider, but their packages are anything but a la carte. Uh, to start off with, you have to pay 20 bucks a month and you don't have a choice as to which channels you want or don't want in that initial package. So here you've got a bunch of stuff that you may not want to watch. I don't watch sports at all. I don't need three channels of ESPN. Uh, so once again, I'm paying for things that I am not watching. Now, a lot of people may find that this is a good value because they do watch all of these channels. But if I were to really cut my cable off, I'd want to get AMC, HGTV, which my wife likes to watch, and maybe uh, the Disney Channel for the kids or something, but I don't want all this other stuff that I'm uh, paying for. And if you go further with the Sling stuff, if you want to add in MTV, for example, you've got to pay another five bucks a month and bring in additional networks that you may not want also. So they really don't make it a true a la carte option. You've got a lot of extra money 
uh, you've got to pay to rebuild what you're cutting from the cable company. You may not save all that much in the process. So not a very consumer friendly thing in my opinion. Uh, PlayStation View is the same kind of thing here. 40 bucks a month, you get more channels obviously, but again, no choice as to uh, what shows up in your package list. And same thing again, you have to pay more to get uh, maybe that one or two extra channels that you wanted to see that aren't in the package you wanted. Again, YouTube TV has a very similar option here where you pay 35 bucks and you have to get all of these networks. And I really feel like if you want to do this right, uh, let me pick and choose the exact networks I wish to watch. At that point, it might be a lot more attractive to me, but to replicate one bad business model, which is this subsidized cable package thing, and just move it over to the internet uh, is not consumer friendly. So hopefully we see some changes there. Uh, what I've been doing, because generally if there's a show on a cable channel that I want to watch, it's usually one or two shows. I found it's cheaper just to buy the show from Amazon or iTunes, for example, than it is to uh, go ahead and call the cable company and go through the rigmarole of adding a package that I really don't need or want. So I think at some point uh, we'll see all of this break away and we'll have more options. But right now these services don't really appeal to me. But maybe, maybe you're having a good experience. So let me know down in the comments below what you're doing. Now this next question comes in from Charles White and he was concerned about my trip to New York City and that he felt like there was a few items there that were ridiculously priced that I should have said were ridiculously priced at the time. I don't know which items he's referring to, so it's hard to say on a case-by-case -case basis which ones those are. Uh, but I did want to mention up front that when I go to these shows, I am looking for things that are of interest to me. I'm not thinking about reviewing them on the spot. I'm, I found some things that I kind of liked just from holding them for a few seconds, like the essential phone. But uh, to really make a judgment about whether or not the price is reasonable is something I would do in a review if I had it here on the table in front of me. I'm certainly not going to uh, walk up to a table there and insult them and tell them their product is a waste of money and a piece of junk. I don't think it's very professional. Uh, so we'll reserve judgment on the price you know, when we get it into review if I do. But I like to just go to these things, meet the companies, find stuff that uh, is of interest and uh, pass judgment on them when we actually do a full on review. And my interests are very diverse. I do cover a lot of low cost stuff here on the channel. In fact, my preference is uh, whenever a company has something they want me to look at, I always say send me the low end version of whatever it is, if you can, because I think that's the most accessible thing for uh, people to look at, especially if you're looking at a laptop, for example, that has 25 different configurations. Let's take a look at what the lowest cost configuration will do for you so you can then project out uh, what an extra processor or some extra memory might uh, do on the more expensive configurations. But I don't like to pass judgment when I'm just sitting there because I haven't had it long enough to decide whether or not uh, it was worth the price. So if he wants to comment more and, and say which ones he felt like I was a little too uh, easy on, I'm certainly happy to do that. I'm thinking about maybe the door lock that I talked about that I think cost $229 with its smart attachment or something. That was certainly uh, more product than what we got with the August smart lock, which incidentally I said was too pricey <laughs> during my uh, review of it. So happy to keep adjusting and making sure I am uh, being upfront with everybody. But really, I just try to find things that interest me and I know interest a lot of you as well and uh, will pass judgment on price in the main review. Now, the second part of his comment is one that I think is probably shared among many viewers of this channel, especially especially those of you who have been watching for a long period of time. So uh, many of you got to know me when I was doing this as a hobby business. It actually started as a hobby, then became a hobby business, and now it is a full-time business. And uh, Charles is worried that I might sell out and become a shill, and he thinks I'm better at reviewing uh, than people on mainstream television. And he felt like maybe I should move into uh, TV as a career as opposed to doing this as a YouTube channel where I do have to go out and get sponsorship every once in a while. And uh, I would love to work in TV, but I think at this point, having worked now for myself uh, exclusively for the last 30 weeks or so, I'm completely unemployable. It is a very liberating thing uh, to be your own boss. I'm actually shooting this right now on Sunday because I am motivated to do it. I don't, I don't take as much of a weekend as I uh, used to take as an example, but but um, really, I think this is a concern that I share with Charles and I'm sure many of the other viewers too, which is making sure this channel does not become an infomercial. And I'm going to tell you up front, I am hungrier for channel growth. And that growth is uh, watch time, subscribers, and views uh, than I am for money. So the, I certainly want to bring in more money to the channel so I can grow it out. There's other things I want to do in media. I'm learning a lot from what I do here. And I'd love for this 
uh, this effort to be an anchor of other things that I'd like to do in the future if I have the resources. And the only way to get those resources, minus going out for venture capital or something, is to uh, grow this business into something that is not only sustainable, but also uh, able to sustain growth with more people and more equipment and all that kind of stuff. And right now, I, I'm sustainable. We're still uh, doing very well, despite having you know, added overhead now of an employee and everything. We're ending the month uh, in the black, as they say. In other words, I am bringing in more than I am outlaying, and that is uh, inclusive of our new staff member. I've planned ahead on all of these things, and I could uh, run a very comfortable business here at this size for a long period of time, but I am putting in something that I am trying to grow, and uh, growth does mean you have to bring in some revenue, but I'm very mindful, again, of not turning this into an infomercial. And uh, one of the things that I started doing when I began this transparency effort where I just give you up front uh, my relationship to the companies, for example, how the stuff came in, all the things that I do in those long uh, disclaimers is really the guiding principles of this channel. And that has actually helped police things because I can ha I have a very easy set of rules to put a potential sponsorship up against. In other words, does it violate uh, my rule that I don't get paid to do reviews? And if it does violate that rule, then I immediately turn it down. And I've turned down a lot of offers and it does cost me some money potentially and uh, not taking on an advertiser. But if the advertiser really wants to direct a uh, sponsorship as a product review, I just won't do it. I just can't uh, do that and hurt my brand because I feel like, you know what, take the hit now financially uh, to build a trusted brand and over time, you know, that trusted brand will grow and that is really going to be my approach here moving forward. Doesn't mean we're not going to have sponsors, but I always try, as you all know, to make the sponsorships of something of value. So with Plex, it's a product that I use myself. I really liked it even before they were a sponsor and uh, there's really cool stuff that I can show you to add value to the channel and I think that sponsorship works out very well here on the channel. We've got a new one coming up that's a lot of fun. I'm able to review something that uh, they're lending to me that is uh, related to their business, but it's not a product they make. So we can do an independent review of something and then uh, bring in their service as a part of uh, what we're talking about. So we're going to do some fun stuff with sponsors and things that uh, I don't think are violating my, uh, my ethics policy here. And I'm very, very mindful of this. And I want you all to know that. And I am sure I will hear from you if you ever feel like I'm stepping over the line. But uh, look, I, again, I'm very much focused on growing the channel uh, from uh, the standpoint of viewers, subscribers, and watch time first, uh, money second. And money is going to be important. It, it always is. But uh, I'm able to comfortably grow this thing and not step into areas where I'm not comfortable. Uh, and that would be an area where somebody wants to pay me to do an infomercial, for example. So we're going to be very careful about this. And as things develop, I will, of course, share them with all of you because this channel is nothing without the subscriber base. And if the subscribers begin seeing me going and veering off in a direction that uh, takes this channel away from what they're used to, then uh, that's going to harm the business in the long run. I'm very mindful of that. So I'm going to be uh, very, very cautious about these things moving forward. And again, I want you all to keep me honest and let me know if you feel like I'm verging in a different direction. And I would love to hear your feedback when we see our first sponsor in this new run uh, starting hopefully next week. Now, this next question is a little more fun, but also an ethics-related question, and that involves the Blockbuster case that many of you see behind me uh, in my videos that I make. In fact, this has become quite the conversation piece over the years as people come in and see this uh, iconic uh, dead brand up on my shelf. And many people wonder, uh, where did this come from? Well, this came from the Old Sabre Connecticut Blockbuster that closed up, unfortunately, a number of years ago. And it is a game, in fact. This game is still in here, actually. Uh, this is a game called Black that was on the original Xbox. It was made by the same people who made the Burnout games, but it was a, a first-person shooter. I had a lot of fun with it. I had rented it at Blockbuster, and they had a policy where if you kept it past the uh, return date for a certain length of time, like two weeks after the return date, uh, you would just be charged for whatever the used price of the game was. And I found it on the receipt there. It was like 29 bucks or something, maybe even less. And I said, yeah, what the heck, I'll keep it. I'm having fun with the game. And that's what I did. Uh, so that is why I have this, and this is not a uh, stolen game. But I, I felt like I would talk about this because Blockbuster, for a while, I think had a better deal than Netflix did. And unfortunately, it was just not financially sustainable. Talk about sustainability. Uh, so what they did is they would mail out your DVDs. I was on their three DVD plan. And uh, then if you took the envelope with the DVD in it back to the store versus mailing it in, uh, you could trade it in and get a rental from the brick and mortar store for free. And in addition to that, you got two coupons a month for games also for free as part of your plan. So I was paying less than Netflix and getting a lot more. But unfortunately, they had to pay the rent on that store. And every time I walked in, I didn't buy anything except maybe this game and a few other used games that I was buying there every once in a while. And I don't know, you know, I was, I was going into the store thinking, you know what, I haven't spent a dollar in this place uh, for eight months, and I don't know how this is going to continue. And sure enough, 
Uh, the deal got less sweet as time went on. It went back to Netflix, and of course, uh, Blockbuster went kaput. But that is the story behind this thing. It was a great time when you could go into a Blockbuster, rent a game with a coupon, and then buy it for uh, pennies on the dollar versus new. And unfortunately, those days are uh, long gone because they just did not have a sustainable model to compete with the Netflix DVD by mail service. And now it's time for a Q&A for you. And I'm very curious about uh, some of the things some of the other channels you're watching did uh, when it comes to sponsorships, things that you liked that they did and things that you didn't like. Please let me know uh, down in the comment stream about perhaps a channel that went in the wrong direction, but perhaps another channel that might have gone in the right direction with a sponsorship that added value without, again, becoming an infomercial. I've been thinking about this a lot. It's really bugging me. And this was long before I got uh, that note from Charles. So I do want you all to uh, give me some idea here as to what you like out there because really it's important for me to make sure that I am uh, meeting your needs and expectations as subscribers uh, in addition to growing the business here. And it is a fine balance that has to be struck and I'm uh, very, very curious about this. So I'd love to hear some ideas from all of you that might give us some more ideas for things that uh, we can do to do some fun sponsorships that uh, don't detract from the value of the content. Now it's time for our channel of the week. And this week I'm going to talk about Mr. Cheesy Cam. He's got a great site that looks at a lot of cool production gear and uh, oftentimes when I am looking at buying something that I need to use here in the studio or for out in the field, uh, Mr. Cheesy Cam has bought it ahead of me and has done a review on it and shown how it works. So uh, you can check him out here at lon.tv slash Cheesy Cam and maybe you'll find some production gear over there that you were thinking about too. Good channel to take a look at. Now this week on the channel, I've got a lot of stuff in that I am hoping to get done, but uh, my main plan here is to first of all review the BenQ projector I talked about last week. We just ran out of time to uh, get that one done, but we've now done all of our testing on it, so that's going to be coming up very shortly. Uh, we're also going to be taking a look at that Xiaomi laptop I was talking about. 13.3 inches, it's got an i5 processor built in, and that new MX150 GPU from NVIDIA. This is the second MX150 based computer we've looked at, but also the smallest one we've looked at, so we'll see how well games run on this thing. This is an exceptional laptop. I'll give you a bit of a preview on it. I looked at the prior version of it last year, so we'll see how this one is improved upon the old one and a bunch of other stuff coming up this week also. Now, if you want to help the channel, you can. You can go to lon.tv slash Patreon to make a monthly contribution to the channel. You can also do a tip jar contribution for a one-time thing at lon.tv slash tip jar. And of course, we have my PayPal if you're outside the U.S. and want to help lon at lon.tv. At some point, it'd be great not to have to worry about sponsors at all. But again, I don't want to put the burden of running this channel on all the subscribers financially. So uh, we'll continue to find a good balance there. But it's been great to see uh, viewer support increasing here. And I greatly appreciate that. And of course, we have our ongoing relationship with Plex. You can find my uh, free Plex opportunity at lon.tv slash Plex. If you sign up for an account, no credit card required, we get a small commission. And of course, you can gift a Plex pass to a friend or family member at lon.tv slash Plex gift. So definitely check that out. And of course, I've got a bunch of other channels as well. We have my extras channel, which we have unboxings and supplementary content on the podcast, which is something that I uh, right now take this show and put on there in audio format. But uh, soon I hope to do a little more with that as I'm beginning to uh, figure out where Corey can best help help me to allow me to do new things. And podcasting is one area I've been thinking about with some uh, exclusive content. And of course, we've got the Snippets channel, which is uh, bite-sized pieces of this video and other things that I've been doing. I'm going to be doing more with that over the next couple of weeks also, mostly reruns, but uh, basically taking out segments of the wrap-up and putting them uh, into a search-friendly format. We also have my VidMe channel at lon.tv slash VidMe, and then our live streams at lon.tv slash live streams. These are archives of some of the live streams that I've done in the past. I'll be doing some more in the future, hopefully, as well. If you are a fan of the channel, I do suggest you hit that notification bell so you get a notification every time I do something on the channel. That's something you definitely want to do. And of course, we have other ways to engage with the channel. My email list at lon.tv slash email. You can join my Facebook page at lon.tv slash Facebook. And of course, we've got the store where I uh, sell the things that I bought here to review on the channel and now uh, getting rid of. And you'll find some new stuff at very good prices there. I've got a few things up there right now that you can check out. And of course, if you don't like the price, make an offer. Maybe I'm feeling generous. You can get an email every time I update the store at lon.tv slash store alert. And that's going to do it for this week's weekly wrap up. 
up. I'm going to enjoy the rest of my Sunday now, and I will get this thing up for you Monday night, which is the time that you'll be watching this video. So please keep those questions and comments coming. Definitely interested in your opinions on my question of the week here for all of you. Uh, so please uh, contribute down below, and thanks again for your support. It does mean a lot to me. So that'll do it. This is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by my Patreon supporters, including Gold Level supporters, the Black Eyed and Blues Music Hour podcast, Chris Allegretta, John Prawl, William Miller, and Charlie Walden. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash Patreon to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.